This Week at NASA. Launch key inserted. Onboard systems have now been switched to onboard control. The commander's cockpit displays and controls have been activated. We feel great. Everything's in order. We're ready for launch. Ignition. And liftoff. Lift Following their launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, NASA flight engineer Chris Cassidy and his Expedition 3536 crewmates, Soyuz Commander Pavel Vinogradov, and Russian flight engineer Alexander Mazurkin are now safely aboard the International Space Station. Contact and capture confirmed at 9.28 p.m. Central Time. The trio was welcomed by ISS Commander Chris Hatfield, Tom Marshburn of NASA, and Roman Romanenko of the Russian Federal Space Agency. The three newcomers begin a six-month residence of the world's only laboratory in microgravity. The SpaceX Dragon cargo ship is seen here moments before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean west of Baja, California, after its fiery re-entry of Earth's atmosphere. Among the two tons of cargo returning with Dragon are investigations that could aid in food production, help develop more efficient solar cells, detergents, and semiconductor-based electronics, and help scientists continue to examine how the human body reacts to long-term spaceflight. Engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center completed assembling and welding two identical pieces of hardware for NASA's new Space Launch System, or SLS. One of the two identical adapters will undergo strenuous structural testing to ensure its twin can successfully connect the Orion spacecraft to its Delta IV launch vehicle. Slated for its first flight test next year, the new SLS rocket will enable human missions farther into space than ever before. After being loaded onto NASA's Super Guppy aircraft, the heat shield for the first Orion spacecraft was flown to the Textron Corporation in Boston, where it'll receive its special thermal protective coating, the AVCOAT. Named for the company that originally developed the honeycomb-like material, will help protect the spacecraft from temperatures up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere during that first test flight scheduled for next year. That Super Guppy also transported two retired T-38s from the Dryden Flight Research Center to El Paso, Texas. There, they'll be dismantled for parts for NASA's fleet of T-38s flown out of the Johnson Space Center. Only the wingtips had to be removed for the two aircraft to squeeze into the Guppy's 25-foot diameter cargo bay. This Super Guppy is the last aircraft of its kind still flying. A new analysis of movies from NASA's Cassini spacecraft reveals previously unseen waves inside Jupiter. The gas giant's bright equatorial zone swirls with dark patches, dubbed hotspots for their infrared glow. The new analysis by scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Jet Propulsion Lab shows that these hotspots are not just local weather phenomena, but are in fact linked to large-scale atmospheric structures called Rossby waves. Here on Earth, Rossby waves can affect the paths of the jet streams and lead to dramatic day-to-day -day changes in weather. The second annual California Aerospace Day at the Capitol in Sacramento became a rare opportunity for Ames, JPL, and Dryden to show some of NASA's latest projects and achievements in the Golden State. Presentations included the evolution of Mars rovers, featuring a mock-up of the Curiosity rover currently making discoveries on Mars, a version of Ames's Chemin, or Chemical and Mineralogy Instrument operating on Curiosity, was demonstrated by team members who were available to answer questions about laboratory science on Mars. There was also information about upcoming NASA missions such as LADEE, which will study the thin atmosphere around the Moon, and IRIS, which will study the shifting temperature of heat that radiates from within the Sun. Maryland Congressman Steny Hoyer held a town hall question and answer session with employees at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Hoyer, who represents the center's district, thanked the men and women of Goddard for their contributions to the scientific community, advancing our understanding of the Earth, the solar system, and beyond. You continue to enrich the life of our nation and indeed advance the cause of human understanding of the universe and our place in it. I want to thank all of you. Uh, for all you do, all the time. Eh, sí, hemos estado en el espacio. Eh, la NASA es una organización.
NASA held its first ever Google Plus Hangout in Espanol. Earth scientist Erica Podest and principal investigator and systems engineer Michaela Munoz Fernandez, both of the Jet Propulsion Lab, shared stories and answered questions about their career paths and contributions to America's space program. This Google Plus Hangout in Espanol was sponsored by Science for Girls, a NASA partnership with libraries for National Women's History Month. I am very proud to be a part of the work that's being done here at Dryden with all the different flight research as well as the role that I feel like meteorology plays in all of it. My name is Francesca Hudis and I'm a meteorologist at NASA Dryden. We forecast for specifically not only the type of aircraft but exactly where they're going to be flying. We give them what we call a pinpoint forecast. We cover projects from uh, X-48, which is a small UAV. Then we get things as large as the 747 the SOFIA project, which uh, flies all the way up to Northern California, across the Pacific, halfway to Hawaii and back within eight or nine hours, which requires looking at uh, if they're going to encounter any clouds or turbulence and things of that nature, as well as the uh, conditions when they get back. We do a lot of work with the F-18s and the F-15s as well, um, a lot of the supersonics projects. Being a pilot myself has definitely given me a better understanding of what the pilots are looking for. What I really like about being at Dryden uh, is that every day is different and every project is different and uh, we not only get to do the operational side of meteorology but we also get to do some of the research side and the data analysis and things like that. The turbulence is, but sometimes there's little signals. This right here. So it was a fifth grade science class that initially got me interested in meteorology. It's always fun to go and uh, work with the kids from various levels, from elementary schools on up to high schools. Uh, it's one of those things that goes relates back to uh, how I got into meteorology and how it was just one little thing that uh, got me interested. So to me, it's showing them what I love and if one, even one of them happens to get even remotely interested in not just meteorology, but any of the sciences or the math, um, technology and engineering, that would just make my day. Five, four, A flock of animated birds has descended on the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex in Florida. The grand opening celebration on March 22nd welcomed the new Angry Birds Space Encounter amid excitement and fanfare. NASA astronaut Don Pettit, who helped launch Angry Birds Space while aboard the International Space Station, introduced the new attraction and its six interactive stations designed to inspire children to explore science, technology, engineering, and math. This is what hands-on learning is all about. A group of fourth and fifth graders from Hampton, Virginia came to a movie entertainment complex for a class in geometry and Newton's laws of motion. It all started with a bowling demonstration. An iPad beamed the action from the lanes into a nearby theater, where education specialists from NASA's Langley Research Center presented lessons to the students and an audience on the web. We model all of the forces that are acting on the vehicle in a computer, and then we fly it in the computer, and we see if we can land safely or not. And we do that literally millions of times. These are the kinds of lessons that stick in a kid's head including one rocking a haircut made famous by a NASA Mars engineer. Before I bowl, I'm gonna like think of all the like, equations in my head, see what would be the best places. Bowling and Mars, a unique way to capture students' attention. Two years ago, on March 29, 2011, the first image taken of Mercury by an orbiting spacecraft was released by NASA, the Messenger spacecraft which 11 days earlier had become the first spacecraft to achieve orbit around Mercury, captured this picture of previously unseen terrain near the small rocky planet South Pole. In the two years since, MESSENGER has imaged 100% of Mercury, revealing new data about the planet's topography, core, and the abundant water, ice, and other frozen materials in its permanently shadowed polar craters. 
And 31 years ago, on March 30, 1982, Space Shuttle Columbia made a successful landing at the White Sands Space Harbor near Las Cruces, New Mexico, to end NASA's third space shuttle mission. STS-3 was one of several test missions to qualify the spacecraft's systems for operational flights. Commander Jack Lausma and pilot C. Gordon Fullerton tested the Canadarm remote manipulator system and gathered data on how Columbia handled the sun's heat in various attitudes. STS-3 was the first and only shuttle mission to land at White Sands. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, or to follow us on YouTube, Ustream, and other media, log on to www.nasa.gov.